Welcome back. How are you? A little bit cold, maybe? Great to, to have you back for the uh, closing session of this third uh, reward and recognition uh, festival, or the other way around, recognition and reward, R&R. &R, you can do it the way you like it. Um, did you enjoy the workshops? Did you learn a lot? This is a great way of assessing things, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll talk uh, more in depth about it. I also found some of the cards, so I'll use these, your input in the, in the panel session. Uh, what will we do during the closing session? Uh, we will have our second columnist for today. Uh, I'll talk with uh, Rihanna Letchert on the international perspective, and then we have a short round table uh, on what did we learn today, what's next, what's coming up. Um, uh, so we'll do that in this closing session. And you also have the opportunity to ask questions again. Also, if you're joining online, we fixed it with the live stream, so hopefully it works now. Um, okay, let's go to our columnist. We asked Noemi Auberbon. Uh, she is postdoctoral researcher in Hasselt University, Belgium, and policy advisor at Research England UK RI. And we asked her, could you give your view on R and R internationally? So please give her a warm welcome, Noemi. I think I took the long route. <laughs> Um, so, thank you for asking me to prepare this column. Um, I prepared this column to give a little bit of an international perspective, but also a very personal perspective uh, on the program and on this reform that's happening right now. So, just a bit of background about me. Uh, I'm a Canadian, I'm Quebecois, to be precise, and I moved to Europe a decade ago to work on research integrity and publication ethics. And that led me to do a PhD on research success and research assessment in Belgium, after which I moved to England, then I worked in the Netherlands, then I continued to work in Belgium, and now I still work in England. So it's a bit of a mess, and uh, every time I'm asked where I'm from, I don't really know what to answer. And this really shapes uh, what I'm talking about today. So uh, when I started my journey as a PhD student, I tried to understand research success by listening to the voices of those involved in research. My project was focused on the Flemish region, um, and as I went along, I realized that even in this small region, the perspective of different stakeholders did not always align. So each have a different role in science, which influence what they want. Researchers want to advance knowledge, but they also have a career to survive in. Um, the funders and the policymakers want to promote good science, but they also have a country to convince about the value of what they fund and about the return on investment. Publishers also want to share the research with the highest quality, but they have a journal to run and they need to attract readership. So the, all these conflicts co to coexist, but what I really realized was that at the same time, everybody agreed on one thing, which is that we need to change research assessment. These uh, complex dynamics are not unique to Flanders. Um, and indeed, after the PhD, I continued to work on similar topics, but adding the Netherlands and the United, the United Kingdom to my uh, Canadian Flemish perspective. And I found similar issues in all of these places. In all four countries, assessors had fallen in love with the simplicity of the journal impact factor, the H index, the number of papers to assess researchers. In all four countries, Groups of academics worried about this, and they denounced the perverse, incent the perverse impact that these incentives had. And in all four countries, as a result of these denunciation, there, the four countries were trying new ways to assess researchers, uh, some at a national level, others through funders group, others through specific institution. Yet, in all four countries, uh, the decades of metric-focused and paper-focused assessment also left behind a culture, that success, a culture of success that cannot change overnight. And even here in the Netherlands, where the reform has been underway for some years already, there are academics who don't really know about it. And how could they? They're already overstretched, often burnt out, and we cannot expect to 
that they will keep up with all of the change that we are doing and that we're putting in the institutions. And even academics who are aware of this reform, uh, like ourselves, will have to fight deeply ingrained habits and conceptions of success for at least another decade before we can really change this, uh, these issues. So all of these points are true uh, in these four countries, but also well beyond these countries. Um, the number of signatories to DORA, for example, illustrate how wide uh, the worry about research assessments are and that it's really, truly a global endeavor. Um, I worked directly on the topic of research assessment for a few years now, and I can tell that at the beginning I would read initiatives about research assessment every month, then every week, and now nearly every day, and I, I cannot keep up with it. Uh, it there's so much happening um, that it's really difficult to read it all and to be aware of everything. And that's very good news. But in speaking a little bit with people who are around me, with uh, many of you who are at the onset of this, these initiatives, I also understood that even though a lot is happening, there's still an ingredient that is missing. And that ingredient is coordination. Uh, we need a, co a coordination so that the stakeholders, the institution, and the countries really move together. Without coordination, the fear of the first mover's disadvantage creeps in. Uh, the institutions fear that their ranking will reduce and their attractiveness to researchers will reduce. The researchers worry that they, if they focus less on the good old metrics, uh, that will damage their mobility or their, their competitiveness in other institutions and countries. And that's where efforts like the Dutch Recognition and Reward Program come in. So in my view, one of the great advantage of this program was that it put together different stakeholders. It put together public knowledge institutions and funders. And this is really one of the advantages of the program. And it's been followed up in different countries as well. I'm here to talk about an international perspective as well. So other countries have followed similar paths. For example, in Norway, univers universities in Norway grouped 32 universities and they started building a national framework and proposed a toolbox for recognition and reward of academics. In the UK, the Future Research Assessment Program, in which I'm, I'm taking part, is also acting in a way to put all the institutions on the same assessment system. Uh, in Latin America, the colleague Claxo has also done something similar, merging the views of different stakeholders uh, to, to get a coordination on research assessment. But on this matter, we're still missing one other ingredient, which is coordination on an international level. And on this, uh, DORA really played a role. There are other uh, organizations that came into play, uh, like the UNESCO, the G7, for those who know the Global Research Council, who started really addressing uh, research assessment on an international level. Uh, but the initiative you probably heard all most from is the Coalition on Advancing Research Assessment, or COERA for friends, um, which includes organizations from over 40 countries and which is shared by someone who is very familiar by the Dutch Recognition and Reward Program. So COERA is special because it commits researchers and re uh, research institutions to action. And I think this is the next step and uh, this is really moving, helping us all move together, helping you as a country move together with, with the others as well. So with all of that, I, I'm being very positive. Is this the end point? Do we have everything that we need? And is it time to sit back and enjoy where we've come from? Well, of course not. And this is just a start, actually. Um, so. I wanted to bring a little bit of a more personal perspective to this column by stating three points that I believe need action right now and that I believe the recognition and reward program can act on. So the first point is that this reform uh, needs to actively make efforts to be more inclusive of forgotten countries. It's wonderful to have something within the Netherlands, but some countries are forgotten. Some countries just managed to move away from quantity indicators and financial reward for each paper published to a system that uses quality indicators like the journal impact factor. 
we need to help these countries to understand their struggles and to support them in moving to yet another assessment approach. We also need to be careful and probe for unintended consequences of what we recommend. So the new approach, uh, for example, of valuing open access, which seems very simple for us, well, that approach created a lot of worries in some countries, which are not covered by APC waivers and are not uh, able to cover the costs of publishing open access. So we need to make sure that we involve and we listen to these countries so that everyone is able to embark on this reform together. This point also applies to the recognition and reward program. Even though it's a Dutch initiative, um, as you could have guessed from my complicated background, I really think mobility is an important part of academic life. And for the reform to work, for your reform to work as well, it needs to keep an international scope and not block the mobility of researchers outside of the Netherlands or within the Netherlands. My second point of action that I think is important is that we need to um, bring more evidence to the table to understand um, research assessments a lot better. And I would even dare to say, especially in this setting, that countries who are so advanced in the reform of research assessment have a duty to pilot, experiment, and evidence new ways of research assessment so they can study the impacts that these new assessments have. The recognition and reward program already attracted a lot of eyes in the past, so it has acquired the visibility needed to bring into evidence this evidence into view. In doing so, we and you will also need to be brave and humble enough to listen again to what works and what doesn't, to accept that we will make mistakes along the way and that we will need to adapt our methods and sometimes admit that we were wrong. We are scientists after all, so we should use our own methods to make this reform a success. And my last point, which uh, links back to the lagging research culture that I mentioned before, is that in my opinion, if we want research assessments to be responsible, we need to give academics the skills, the mindset, and the time to conduct responsible assessment. So first, um, as was mentioned this morning, the culture of responsible assessment needs to start early on at the PhD level and even before that. Here and in many places around the world, PhD students are still expected to publish three papers before they can defend their thesis, and other outputs don't really count into that. In some institutions, the, cumul the cumulative impact factor of these papers even needs to reach a certain score. And also here, PhD students are sometimes penalized if they don't finish their PhD in the expected completion period. For example, they won't receive the financial help they need to print the thesis. And this all adds to the pressure and the expectation of productivity. So we need to change these dynamics and these pressures earlier if we want a culture to change. Along the same line, we also need to provide academics with an environment that allows them to rebuild their views of success, here and anywhere in the world. But this means balancing workloads, providing dedicated time for peer assessment, for assessment in general, securing research career, and I, as an early career researcher on time-limited contract, I completely agree with the column of this morning. Um, and also providing longer funding schemes so that the pressure to publish and survive do not predominate over the desire to innovate on views of success. So for the recognition and reward program, this can mean working together with research institutions to identify how they can make sure that their research environments support researchers and academics in this transition period and also afterwards. Or to echo the scope framework, for those of you who know the scope framework, we need to evaluate with the evaluated. We need to listen again to what they need in this reform. So as a summary and to conclude, the main message of my column is that we need to listen. We need to listen to the many countries who are still scarcely involved in this discussion but need our support. We need to listen to the data to what we find about research and assessment, and we need to listen to the evaluated, including early career researchers. Thank you.
Thank you, Noemi Oberbond. A wonderful introduction to the international perspective uh, uh, we are going to talk about. Uh, also with uh, Rianne Letchert, uh, president of Maastricht University and the newly elected chair of uh, the Coalition for Advancing Research Assessment, or as Noemi said, COARA for friends, um, and co-chair of the Recognition and Rewards Steering Group. Give her a warm hand, Rianne. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, so um, let's start with what uh, Noemi said. Uh, the countries around us are actually watching how we do it in the Netherlands. Um, are you proud of what we're doing in the Netherlands? Oh, is, it, is it an export product uh, internationally? Absolutely. Is it working? Okay. You have to put it like this. It looks so awkward, doesn't it? <laughs> But it works. No, of course, if I, if I only look at the audience and, and saw the discussions during the workshops where we have come from five years ago, a position paper, and if I then see where we stand now, with so much energy, with maybe the opposition that we had in the beginning now coming closer to each other, still addressing concerns and critique, which is important, no, I'm absolutely uh, very proud. And while you're asking, um, I think it's also fair now to ask for a really big applause for the national project team uh, that actually makes sure that the 14 universities, NWO, NFU, KNW, work together to make sure that we also go into the same implementation phase. And the national project team that is led by Kim Huyve, who is in the back, where is she? I don't see her anymore. Ah, there she is. <laughs> um, they work like on a daily basis to make sure that we make this progress. And since they're often in the back offices and never get the stage, I think it's fair that we say, as you say, a warm hand, a warm hand. for Kim and her team. So um, now you're going internationally with our Dutch export products. <laughs> What yes. do you do with, yes. for instance, Kowara? Could yes, you explain? Co who knows about Kowara? Wow, that's still because uh, I never heard of it before I got uh, pushed into becoming uh, <laughs> the, the chair. Um, yeah, it's it's a wonderful initiative that was that started way before I was elected as the chair. And Karen Strobans is also here in the audience. Maybe she can stand up. Because Karen is the one, is actually the main author of the coalition and the person who made sure that we got to a coalition. So a warm applause for Karen is absolutely required. It's because all about small gestures. I like today, recognition right? and rewards. Yeah, yeah. We're and rewarded. since I get the stage, but I didn't do the work. Uh, <laughs> What Ka Karen and her team did is, over a period of a little bit more than a year, work together with a group of very energetic uh, people to get to this coalition agreement, in which there are very clear objectives to advance the uh, reform of research assessment, that, the topic of today. And what did they do? Uh, they actually had a similar method as we had. They included both the research institutes, the universities, other knowledge institutions, and the funders. Because as we all know, this, we are all part of one ecosystem, and if we change the rules within the universities, but the funders don't, it will not work. You will not change your behavior. So we need to work together to make sure that we get to the reform that we want. So Karen and her team, came to that coalition, uh, to, that, to that manifest, which is at this moment uh, signed by 500 uh, partner institutions in not only EU member states, but also beyond the EU. And as Naomi rightly said, it is really important that we also do this together because science is international. We cannot have this movement only work from the, from the Netherlands or Norway. But what I see now in the Koara uh, work that I'm now doing, Zooming in Japan, in Australia, in Latin America, addressing the Koara objectives, that a lot of the reform that we are talking about in the Netherlands also take place in these countries. This is not a Dutch initiative. Luckily, that it's not a Dutch initiative. Yeah. So that really also gives comfort, I think, to many of the early career researchers, that it's not something 
that is only done in the in the Dutch environment. Yeah. And for instance, also uh, teaching activities, do you also deal with that within Kawara? No, that is the only thing uh, um, that is different from what we do uh, with the recognition and rewards program. Within the uh, drafting group, uh, it was at some point decided that the Kawara manifesto will focus on the reform of research assessments, thereby not saying that countries should not also think about broader uh, initiatives developing career paths relating to teaching in impact uh, leadership like we do, mm -hmm. but the manifesto focuses on research uh, assessments, reform. Now we have of course examples uh, led by Ruth Graham, who's not here, otherwise I would have asked her to stand as well, uh, because she has, she's leading the advanced teaching network and she's been also at many of our activities uh, in, the, in the Dutch program developing career paths for our teaching staff, for our academic staff that wants to develop themselves as a teacher. So these initiatives are aligned with each other, but it, they're separate yeah. in a sense. But what I see when I'm addressing audiences in the international environment on Koara, that many of the audiences say we would like to have a broader approach. We want to reform the assessment in research, but also take into account the other domains, yeah. like we do. And I, I do believe that that is a clever approach from a country perspective, from Koara, it's a lot of work in the research domain to get to new forms of research assessment. There are a lot of concerns. There's a lot of critique from certain disciplines. We face that also in the Netherlands, but also internationally. Uh, that it's about certain interests that people fear that they will lose. Uh, so there is a lot of work to do to make sure that the disciplines accept the new ways of research assessment that we want to introduce yeah. for the individuals the research teams, the institutes, the universities, there are different layers of assessment. Yeah. And I think it is okay that we focus within Koara on that reform. It's hard enough to... It's hard enough yeah. already there to come to a common understanding of how we want to conduct these assessments. Yeah. You already mentioned a little bit about the concerns. What, what are the concerns? Oh, the concerns, which you also hear in the Dutch environment, that uh, qualitative assessment is always biased, not objective. Uh, um, that uh, the quality of research will go down, that we will uh, develop only average researchers. It's all a myth. I, I never get to the core of those arguments, but the arguments are made. And people honestly feel that uh, also within our own uh, political arena, some parties say recognition and rewards will lead to average researchers. Well, you tell me why. I just don't see it. I can also not have a counter argument or even get to understand that argument, but that's really not the case. But that's also what you hear in the international environment. So we have to come with tools that are accepted and validated also with academic research that will give the uh, communities the confidence that there is a proper assessment tool in yeah. place. That I understand, and that's what we will do within Koara. There will be lots of working groups, national communities of practice, where we will share uh, all the developments that are already out there. With the end result, hopefully, that will take also some years. Things move slowly within academia, I must say, <laughs> eh, when it's about reform. But that we, would, that we will come to a set of standard guidelines, uniformization of assessment tools that we will, as an academic community, also use and accept. Yeah, and That's the idea. Is it also um, whenever you want to work abroad or be an academic in a country that you can check, ah, this is a Kawara University yes. approved by Kawara. Yes, you can see the signatures. Yeah, yeah. I have to go there. But there's still work to do, eh? because if you look at the Kawara website, you will see where we have most signatures. And then, it, for instance, the German uh, academic community is staying behind. Uh, actually the German-speaking countries, um, UK, we still have lots of work to do. So we're not there yet, eh? but we started January. So we are now 500. Uh, give us a few more World Dominion. months. No, yeah. give us a <laughs> few years and uh, we'll be globally represented. We have room for one question from the audience. Over there in the back. Yeah, Thomas is going to run. It's great, you, you'll be warm. Over there. <laughs> yeah, if you could stand up and mention your name. Uh, hi, I'm Nelly Konendijk from 
ANAVE, the uh, Royal Society, and I uh, just heard a, a great appeal about involving different countries, different uh, that, that are not speaking right now. We just had a workshop I did together with my with my co-host uh, Thomas Hogeboom, and he mentioned something that I think is worth repeating, and a question maybe also to you, which is, we now reform the university system with the people that succeeded in this system. Are we also going to involve the people that have dropped out, that are no longer in science for certain reasons, and that actually don't function in the current system, because otherwise we keep making these differences that are small instead of transformative. So then you mean people who have left academia already, yes. yeah? So not yeah. the early career uh, researchers. Well, I, yeah. what I see in the um, activities that I have participated in, that there are, are always uh, former colleagues in the room that will address and explain the experiences that they have had in leaving academia or moving towards a support staff role, also not without a reason. But it's mostly, mostly the second category that we see in our workshops, in our steering boards, also in Kowara, but not so much the ones that have really left. So I think that's an excellent suggestion to see how can we reach uh, that group to give their input during these reform processes. That's a very good suggestion. Yeah. We'll put it on our action list. So the early career academics and the ones that left academia, yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah. shouldn't good idea. be forgotten. Yeah. yeah, with regard to the early career researchers, maybe, what, what we discussed, uh, Jeroen and I, in our sh uh, short break, we've heard now from the uh, PhD and postdoc perspective several times during these sessions that they feel that, they are, that their voices are not heard. And I think that's a serious uh, 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 note that we uh, have to take into account. So what we will do, we will discuss in the next uh, steering board of the national program, if we can ask the uh, PhD network and the postdoc network to be represented in that steering board. It's something we need to decide together, so I will not do that now, ask for yes, because the whole steering board is here. <laughs> Maybe they now already say yes. Uh, this is democracy, how it works. <laughs> but I think that's really a good, uh, uh, good that they voice that again. Um, and with regard to the PhDs, what we tried in Maastricht is to uh, come to a, a policy uh, document or, or a policy in general in which we ask the PhD to reflect on how they would like to see their PhD trajectory to be changed with a view of the recognition and rewards ambitions. And in the end they said what we don't want is that all the domains that you have now addressed within recognition and rewards would become part of our PhD trajectory as a compulsory part of that trajectory, because we also like these four years to be able to focus on research, but have the opportunity to also develop yourself in the other domains. Now, so we in the end said, well, it's, it's now a very broad framework that we have developed, but it's still, I think, also an ongoing discussion within the steering board if we should address that particular group. But again, the views from the PhDs themselves was, don't put more pressure on our shoulders, as in developing ourselves in all these domains in this early, early phase of our career. Yeah, give us options but as well. Give yeah. us options, indeed. Yeah. Thank you very much. Welcome. Rianne Letchert, give a warm hand. <laughs> and we're going to continue the conversation, but also coming to an end of this day with a wonderful panel. I'll introduce them first. Jeroen Geurts, Inge Werner, and Marileen Dochtrom. And then I'll introduce you more properly. Give them a warm hand. Uh, Jeroen Geurts, Rector, Ma Rector Magnificus of the VU Amsterdam and co-chair of the famous steering group already. I'll, I'll say the steering group consists of representatives from universities, UMC, KNW, NWO, Zon NW, I'm starting to speak Dutch, provides national guidance for the National Recognition and Rewards Program. That's what you are, uh, who you are, <laughs> among others. Uh, Marileen Dochterom, uh, president of the KNW, the Royal Academy of Arts and Sciences. I always use the word 
Netherlands Academy, exactly, and the r, &R Steering Group, and Inge Werner, Director of Social Sciences and Humanities at MEO, and Chair of the Recognition and Rewards Committee at MEO. Great to have you here. Um, I'm going to give you just some cards to read as well, some input uh, we received. So you can take a look uh, while I'm asking questions. Um, first question, Jeroen, so you can't read now. What did you learn today? What did I learn today? Uh, many things, actually. Uh, I learned that uh, we are becoming a great community, uh, which is new, I think, in the sense that we've been uh, searching for the right message for a number of years, and uh, there were parties that were slightly opposed to each other, but now we're more and more um, a community that shares practices and looks to each other for uh, advice. So that's very good. That's um, uh, the first thing that I observed. And another thing is what Rihanna already uh, said, uh, that we have a number of groups who feel underrepresented. Yeah. So uh, early career scientists, uh, but also non-scientific personnel, uh, which is not a very nice word because they are valid in themselves and not valid because of the not being something else. But um, uh, they should be included. And uh, the last thing that I find very important is that we're still not talking enough about teams. So everybody is part of the team, as far as I'm concerned. And in that team, there is room for everybody to bring what they have to bring. And that is, I think, uh, key uh, within recognition and rewards. Yeah. Thank you. Great summary. I, th I thought it was also on here, right? The supporting staff. Don't yeah. forget. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Marilene, what did you learn today? Well, um, first of all, I was very inspired already early morning with the, with the contributions we had. And also, you know, everything Naomi said, I, I learned today and I agree with all you said. Uh, it was very inspiring to see things that are also close to my heart. Eh? Listening to each other, think about coaching uh, younger staff, people who are growing up in the, the system. Uh, and discuss uh, what it is that you are aiming for and keep going in this discussion uh, to, to sort of learn from each other uh, what, what it is that we're aiming for and how to achieve that. It's a discussion that never ends and it's really the conversation that we need and uh, that we are having now. It's very optimistic today, I would say. There's a lot of people here and that we have to keep doing that. What I then learned from the two workshops, one that I didn't go to, uh, and that was uh, what, what I thought was a refreshing way of thinking about this, is that, of course, we have a long way to go. It's also here. It says, what did you learn? r, &R has a lot of potential, a long way to go. And of course, uh, as, as Rihanna also said, and this, you always wanted to go faster, but it takes time. But what if we just think 25 years into the future, 30 years? I was not at the workshop but somebody explained it to me, where are you? Uh, that it's very, uh, also a good way maybe to just forget about how it is now and the steps we want to take, but put yourself 25 years into the future and think about the academic community that you would like to see then. And it was the picture that I saw extremely colorful with lots of ways in, but also out that were all equally attractive. And I think it was, uh, uh, it was governed by AI, if I come... Yes, there you are. Uh, did I summarize it correctly? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that I learned, even though I didn't go to the workshop. Uh, and then I also learned from the workshop that I did go to that uh, this is about sharing best practices, I think. In Nijmegen, I was very uh, impressed by the program that is going on there uh, about how, you know, think... Uh, uh, basically a project, the process of how to develop a way to assess uh, research. So what are the pillars that you would like to assess? And so you, you see that you get to, actually at the basis of everything, there's climate, ethos, safety, that's sort of a boundary condition. Mm. Then there's rigor, also a boundary condition. And then you have the things that grow out of it. That's what we came to, uh, you know, relevance, originality, and all these things you need uh, as a system to be able to assess quality. And then of course, that still sounds very good, but then it's still difficult, I think, uh, the how. Eh? So what I now, as was said also by you, it was easy and lazy to just count and, uh, and, yeah. and assessing quality is hard work. I yeah. always say that. And then to, then to do it exactly is still difficult. And I think that's where we still have the long way to go. And, and maybe the last thing I'll say is, 
you know, even though we have a long way to go and there's lots to be done, we should be very sensitive, I think, to the people, uh, uh, early career researchers, PhD postdocs, who are on a fairly short time frame, eh? so they don't have uh, five or ten years to see what we come up with, yeah. and still need clarity and transparency also now, even though we're still in transition. So I think we have to be very uh, mindful of that, uh, yeah. that we don't create unwanted extra pressure because of this process that we are going through. Yeah. yeah. You only have one life, right? <laughs> and then it has to be arranged. Yeah, yeah supposedly. <laughs> I, I assume. Inge, what did you learn today? Testing. <laughs> I'm not very good with these things. I hope you can hear me. Um, I learned a lot of things today, I guess. And what, stri what struck me most maybe was that um, recognition and rewards is really about culture change. Because as you can imagine, at NWO, we, we think a lot about research assessment. Um, and I think we think a lot about uh, research assessment in terms of tools, outputs, um, a system kind of world. And today I was at a workshop by the um, uh, Free University of uh, Amsterdam. Are the colleagues still here? They had this very impressive uh, program in place for leadership. And it made me realize that this kind of change we want uh, can't be made without leadership. So it was not, not just about uh, classical academic leadership or about management, but also about personal leadership. Um, and yeah, maybe that's what I, I, I learned most, that if we all have a, a different part or, or can all play a role in this change, um, yeah, then we can easily make it happen. In case you have a question, raise your hands, right? So I can uh, give you uh, the floor. Um, which good practices did you uh, encounter? Lots of good practices. So all universities, all um, research institutes, uh, the funders, everybody is working on good practices and learning on the go. Um, and they've been shared, and uh, more so during uh, coffee breaks, I think, than uh, during the workshops. But uh, another thing that I was thinking about uh, as you were, sp were speaking is that um, I was at a workshop about science communication. Um, so we also have to think about how to build in uh, our communication strategy within the teams that we organize. So um, what is science communication? Is it just um, something that we do just like we do research and education um, or how uh, we provide impact? No, I think it's more than that. It's it's like, and I know that some of the science communicators are not happy when I say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. It's like a glue in our practices. It's like thinking about how are we going to bring everything together? How are we going to um, make science and education and creating impact? How are we going to do that? It means that we have to attract communicators right from the start. So there is a lot that, that we haven't thought through sufficiently yet. Um, but I've heard a lot of good ideas today. So could you give an example of how we could do that? Or do you so have an idea how we could? It means a, a set shift. It means that you have to think of science communication in a different way. Uh, it's not something that you do when your research is done and then you write a press release. Yeah. Uh, it's something that helps you formulate the research question. Yeah. and also uh, brings together different disciplines. Um, and you know probably as well as I do that when bringing different, different disciplines together, there is a translation problem, always. Yeah. Uh, so maybe science communicators can help bridge those gaps. Uh, it means that, that we have to rethink the whole process of academic life and work. Uh, and that's what, we've, that's what we've been doing the past few years. But uh, in the coming years, um, there's still a lot of work to be done, I think. Yeah, yeah. And maybe you also become a better researcher when you're Absolutely. better at science communication. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So I think everybody should think about communication, um, even if they're not happy standing on a stage. Yeah. You don't have to do that. It's just that you um, probably have to rethink a little bit about what communication is and when you need it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, questions from the audience. Yes, raise your hand really high. We have one, two questions. I, you had a question before already, so you'll get, definitely get the turn after this question. Hi, uh, Linda Hartman. Oh. 
CWI and the University of Utrecht. Uh, so what I've seen today has really made me very optimistic. Um, and I think certainly a number of the universities are on the right track in helping the younger generation grow their career. Uh, so my next difficult question of the day is, currently we have personal grants, Veni Vidi Vici, and these are based on excellence. Um, and there are far too few of these grants compared with the population of excellent people in the country. So do we have to continue our assessment on excellence? Do we scrap the grants? Or do we think of something else? Okay. What do we do? <laughs> Who has an idea? I can start. I mean, I, I think we just learned that the word excellence is yeah, quite hollow, right? We got rid of it. Quality. <laughs> Qual Qualities. Yeah, rigor or, no, or originality. I don't know. I, I, don't, I, I don't believe in, you know, this cannot happen, that cannot happen. You need a spectrum. So I think uh, uh, if, 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 if we too tightly connect grants like this to a specific word where nobody really means what it really happens, you have to have a discussion on what... Uh, and, and that's, I think, where this research assessment discussions are very useful, because there is a way, I think, to assess, you know, is somebody posing an original question or not? Is it uh, relevant uh, uh, to, to society or science or not? So you can discuss these things. And then providing grants for really uh, brilliant original ideas, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, so, uh, but uh, the, to make that sort of the, the only thing in the spectrum and the only thing that counts, that's probably not a good idea. So you need a spectrum of ways uh, of conduct uh, research, a bit of competition for research money. There's also nothing wrong with it, as long as there's a balance. So, you know, kicking one thing out and replace it with something else, in my opinion, you know, just brings you other problems. So you have to think about this, this balance. So uh, I would not uh, get rid of it, no. Expansion, as the minister said this morning. Yeah, 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 yeah but of course, at the, I mean, that's a finite size system still, right? So uh, you have to, to somehow agree with each other where this balance is and, and uh, with limited number of resource sources in terms of money, people, that's always a boundary condition which you have to be honest about. Yeah. Uh, let me go to the question first. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is uh, Juri Tijding from uh, VU University in Amsterdam, uh, Amsterdam University Medical Center. My question uh, relates uh, to a recent project that I would like to mention that's called the Iedereen Professor Project from, uh, from, our, from uh, the Young Academy. And what we uh, try to do there is that we want to give um, uh, more rights to uh, university uh, lecture to, um, to people at the university, like the uh, the assistant professors and associate professors, and give them more, empower them more to um, uh, to to uh, promote uh, PhD uh, candidates, uh, but also to wear a gown, for example, in official ceremonies. Um, and I would. I was wondering, uh, and I think this would definitely give them more rewards and recognition uh, in their career in their, in, uh, for these, uh, for these um, researchers. My question, of course, is, of course, I would like to tell you about it, uh, but of course I have to raise a question. My question is, what do you think about this, and how would this, uh, uh, how would this affect the recognition and reward uh, uh, system? He wants to know, do you think it's a good idea or not? <laughs> yeah, he wants to... Uh... We, we've been discussing already uh, during, uh, during coffee break, so perhaps oh, yeah, yeah. the, the non-herd... I think it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> and why? Well, it's lovely. It's, it's mainly because uh, I think uh, many times when, when someone takes a PhD, it's the it's a su supervisor who, who does all the work, and it's the promoter or the, the professor who, who sort of gets the credits in a ceremony. Um, so, yeah, why not? Yeah? Yeah, so for the sake of transparency, is a bit of an een tweetje, as we say in Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I totally agree if for the reasons that you mentioned. Uh, of course, you have to think about the details of what does it mean and uh, think through, through that. But, but the, at the essence, I think it, it contributes to something that I think needs to be part of this whole process, and that is reconsidering the hierarchy that we've built into the system, and the dependency and the uh, yeah the, the the incentives that come with that. Eh? So there's all kinds of 
uh, reasons, I think, to rethink the hierarchical system in terms of social safety, and this is part of that. Yeah. Because if you get recognized for the work that you do at a scientific level, uh, supervision, ideas, independent of uh, how much broad experience you may have eh, as still a, a senior or a junior academic, but for this specific topic, I would say it makes a lot of sense, and it's also not a terribly, um, how would you say, uh, revolutionary idea. Uh, it's, it was like that in the past, it's like that in many other countries, so to me it's a no-brainer. Yeah. Ah. The crowd loves it. <laughs> A little bit revolutionary then, maybe, uh, still, yeah. Um, but there might be concerns about this as well, right? Of course, and so, that's fine. So yeah. we discuss them. Yeah. 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 So one, one of the things that we were discussing during coffee break is that <clears throat> if it uh, actually solves the problem of um, differences between professors and non-professors in, in the sense that the non-professors are doing the work, but the professors are being rewarded for it, then, of course, we should do it tomorrow. Um, I was wondering whether uh, when we start thinking more in terms of team organization, um, we can already do a lot and much more than just giving people a gown to wear. I think within teams we need to discuss what is everybody's contribution uh, and how can we value them for exactly that, what they are doing and contributing. Uh, so, so. It's, a, it's a, an idea worth exploring, uh, and, and the ground um, idea is, is fantastic, I think, to, to get rid of um, non-earned praise. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, a last question over there. Thanks very much. My name is Maisa campus -Punz. I'm from the FU University. And um, I just want to draw your attention that I think we uh, are um, um, forgetting about one important group. Uh, and I work a lot with these people. Um, these are the very junior lecturers. We call them junior judos at the FU. Or more recently, we call them jewels because of the work they do. Uh, so they're early careers also, but I haven't heard uh, them being mentioned today. So I wonder how you think they can be rewarded and how we should help them in their careers. And may I ask you first, what would you like? What, would you, what do you need? Um, I think I would like them to give them a perspective uh, in after they work at the FU or even within the FU or another university. So I would like to give them more perspective, a career perspective. So okay. Rihanna is complaining that there are too many VU people here. Yeah, there are too many VU people here. But I'm actually quite happy about that. Yeah. <laughs> they dare to speak up. They dare to speak up. <laughs> Long live the VU. No, uh, uh, to, to come to your question, great question. And I fully agree that junior uh, teachers should be part of uh, that, uh, that team plan. You should just, as a department head, be able to make, and, and behind you, uh, we have our um, uh, recognition and rewards uh, team leader, so you can talk to her. Um, we are actually building plans, uh, and I know in, in, in other universities they're doing exactly the same, building plans uh, to ask uh, department heads to build their strategic team. And uh, within that team, there should be junior teachers, there should be very experienced teachers, there should be researchers, there should be... And, you know, of course we're steering for excellence or quality, I should say, for quality in all those domains. Uh, but it's, it's on the team level that you should think, you know, what is necessary for our plan to become reality. And that doesn't mean that every junior uh, teacher is going to get a fixed contract. But at least you, you give them the opportunity to, to work in that team and to tell them upfront uh, what they may expect from you as, a, as an institution. Okay. Maybe a last answer from someone from the steering committee. Um, what's next? What's, I mean, of course, I'll explain about the drinks, but what's, what's next with the, with the recognition and rewards? Uh, what's coming up? Well, for me, it's, uh, it's, it's practice what we preach, I think, pun intended. <laughs> uh, this was my first festival, and I really enjoyed it, so I'll, I, I'll, I'll be here next year, and I hope to see a lot of progress then.
Marilene, what's next? Yeah, I would repeat what uh, Noemi said. Yeah, let's allow ourselves to make mistakes and, uh, and try out things and not think that there's only one way of doing this, but keep this conversation going and, uh, and make sure uh, yeah, that what I said earlier, that, that, and this is a difficult one, that we at the same time keep sort of clarity on what it is, uh, how, how we're doing things now. And that's a bit the difficulty, I think, because we want to change things. But uh, for somebody who's looking for a contract extension next year, yep. that's a bit uh, um, yeah, difficult. So I have a, don't have a solution. And the other thing that's next is also mentioned already, and it's happening very quickly, is the international dimension to it. Yep. Uh, so in Europe, there's a lot going. but. Uh, uh, from also talking to uh, uh, fellow academies, even you know, in, in, in South America or, or Africa, the global south, as we call it, this, this is a topic everywhere. It has a different impact in different places, but a research precarity, if that's the word, it's also sometimes mentioned. So the, 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 the uncertainty of academic careers is, is very, uh, it's different, but it's sort of everywhere present, and we should try, uh, as we are a global community in science, yeah. really uh, reach out to each other. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. May I uh, have a warm hand for Jeroen Geert, uh, Marilene Dochterom and Inge Werner. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and since uh, Hika Huistra started today in her column with the importance of small gestures, uh, I'd like to thank you, all of you. Um, also, if you're joining us uh, online, uh, for sharing your ideas and concerns uh, also here. You can still hand them in, all your ideas and, uh, and lessons you've learned. Um, this is a movement, so keep moving. <laughs> it's an ongoing conversation. Um, and afterwards, you'll receive an invitation for a review which is a platform where you can find all the documents from the workshops, but also continue the conversation. Maybe you can also put the columns uh, on there as well. Um, I would say spread the word. You're an ambassador, hopefully, uh, uh, for R&R. Uh, &R. Uh, and also, let's continue the conversation, of course, during the drinks. Um, and uh, thank you for being here once again. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Bye. <laughs>